know, I have to admit to being a girl who quite likes stuff. Not for me the dainty little handbag or the compact overnight case. No, it's everything and the kitchen sink as far as I'm concerned. So I suppose that one day I shall have to bow to this practical side of my nature and invest in the ultimate carrier of stuff, the estate car. Yes, carrying people's stuff has become big business and all the car manufacturers have cottoned on to that. Luckily for them, it appears there are plenty more people out there like me who also feel the need to have their stuff with them wherever they go. And these days, you don't need to fork out a fortune for the privilege. Carrying stuff may be big business, but so is the small car market. Put the two together and what do you get? The 306 Estate, Vauxhall's Astra Estate, the Honda Civic Aerodeck, and this, the latest baby from Citroen, the Zara Estate. Now, as we all know, the Zara may have enlisted the help of that ultimate supermodel babe, Claudia Schiffer, to promote its looks, but in reality, it doesn't really set that many photographers' flashbulbs on fire. However, add a little bit extra to the back, and it's suddenly become quite elegant. This is a rare occasion where the estate is actually an improvement in the looks department. It's quite sleek, and instead of having roof bars, the Zara's mounting points are integrated into the roof, keeping its lines nice and smooth. Inside is also nice. It isn't exactly stylish and it isn't exciting, but it's functional, it's well laid out, and everything feels very solid, which is what you want in an estate car that's bound to get plenty of use. One touch that I particularly like is the way the controls for the stereo are mounted up here on the steering wheel. I think it's a good safety feature and something more manufacturers should do. But hey, enough of the interior. Let's get back to all that stuff. How big is this car? Will I get everything and the kitchen sink in here? Well, it has apparently the largest load space in its class. And if it means anything to you at all, it has 517 litres of boot space. An amazing 1,512 litres when you fold the back seats down. No, it means nothing to me either. And if you like to play hunt the map pocket and spot the secret storage space, then you're in for a treat, because the Citroen Zara estate is packed full of practical little touches. Look, two glove boxes, door bins, a little stuff holder in the middle here, another one in the dash, and even more space for stuff cunningly concealed in the door armrests. And here at the back, the bumper has been cleverly built into the tailgate to give you a lower loading area. Inside here, there's a parcel shelf, there's yet more cubby holes, and a net with points to tie things down to. Like your husband, the kids, or maybe even the dog. Come on, Woody. <laughs> And the Zara's not only got litres of space in the load area, but the driver and passengers all have plenty of head and leg room. It's just a shame, though, that to get a split rear seat, you really need to go for one of the two rather expensive top trim levels. Out on the road, well, let's be honest, you're not going to buy an estate car and expect sizzling performance and wonderful dynamics, are you? But it actually doesn't feel that different to the five-door. Now, whether that's a plus point for the estate or a mark against the saloon, I'm not too sure. The handling feels solid and stable and the ride is comfortable. The suspension and the tyres on the Zara estate have been uprated to cope with all the extra weight, which has made the ride much firmer. Maybe a little too firm for some passengers. Powering this version is a 1.9 diesel engine, which has been around for a while now in both Peugeots and Citroëns. And I have to say it's showing its age, it really doesn't have the refinement of some of its rivals. And most importantly, it isn't as economic as them. Better bets engine-wise are the 90 brake horsepower 1.6 or the 112 brake horsepower 16 valve. Also on offer is an underpowered 75 brake horsepower 1.4 and a 1.8, which is unique to the SX Automatic model. The cheapest 1.4 will set you back just £12,470 and the top of the range 1.8 is 15,700. With this turbo diesel exclusive, the most expensive in the range at 15,800 pounds. The Citroen Zara Estate isn't the most remarkable car that you could buy, but it is pretty hard to fault. So if you've reached that point in your life where you need plenty of space to carry all your 
stuff round with you, then this is a very good estate car at a very reasonable price. <laughs> Welcome, Lancashire, and day two of a three-day, 2,000-mile road test of Mitsubishi's Charisma, powered by its revolutionary gasoline direct injection engine. This is the first petrol engine in the world to be directly injected, as diesels are, without the need for an inlet manifold, and Mitsubishi makes some brave claims on its behalf. It's an 1800cc unit with the same power output as a 2 litre, but with the economy of a diesel. To put this to the test, a run to Land's End, John O'Groats and home again, I reckon, should verify or ridicule these claims. Also on test was the Traffic Master system, which was there to warn of impending traffic jams. But in the 650 miles of day one, we hadn't been troubled by any holdups at all. And yet, we're told we're heading for gridlock. Not the sign of it here. On reaching the Scottish border, we stopped at the legendary Gretna Green. This is the first house in Scotland. This was where you paid your toll to cross the border from England into Scotland. There are a lot of traditions attached to this place too, aren't there? Yes, we've been going since 1830. Uh, in those days, uh, the laws in England and Scotland were different. If you just crossed the border at 16, you could be wed uh, without parents' consent, uh, which didn't apply in England. You had to be 21 across the border. Uh, this uh, doesn't carry on nowadays as the age, but people still do come here to get married. Heading northwards again, our next stop was Glasgow, where our average MPG of over 42, over hill and dale, motorways and lanes at a wide variety of speeds, came fully into focus. Um, better get some petrol. Yesterday afternoon I filled up south of Exeter. Here we are 516 miles later in Glasgow on one tank. That is truly amazing. That's economy. With wallets still reasonably intact, we left Glasgow behind and headed for the Highlands. The car was proving extremely comfortable and the air conditioning a positive boom, making such long distances entirely pleasurable to cover. Some of the scenery we drove through was breathtaking and at times completely dwarfed the car. But there were other delights too. Now I know this isn't a cookery programme, it's a motoring programme, but I've got in my bag here a real Scottish delicacy. I've been dying to try it, and I'm eating it with a bit of trepidation. Deep fried Mars bar. Not bad actually. Not bad at all. Sorry, Steve, you can't have any.
The journey to John O'Groats is a beautiful and enchanting one, and I cannot recommend it highly enough to anyone who finds driving today something of a chore. The joy of pressing north on deserted roads through unspoilt countryside is difficult fully to convey, but the memories will remain with me for a long time. As will that special moment when we finally arrived at John O'Groats, Britain's northernmost point, as the evening light finally left the sky. Now this is going to be a big year for Vauxhall, it has to be with the launch of the new Astra. General Motors Chairman Jack Smith has already admitted that he's taken his eye off the ball in terms of the European market, so the Astra really is a crucial car for them. We got our first look at it about a year ago and now we get a chance to see it in the flesh and to drive it here in Austria. And this is it. What do you think of it? I quite like the look of it. Maybe it looks like a, a mini Vectra, but it has a new chassis, new floor pan, new suspension, and a new interior. It is an all new car. Now the Focus is still some months away. VW are having problems delivering the Golf, so perhaps this is Vauxhall's big opportunity to get the Astra selling in the marketplace. Now on the outside, I like the design. All the panels seem to fit very well and quality has certainly been paramount in the making of this new car. It has a, a butch, slightly aggressive stance to it, but still unmistakably an Astra. It'll come in a choice of three door, a five door, there's an estate and a mini MPV a la the Renault Scenic. They're calling it the Zephira, should be with us in about a year's time. There are four petrol engines, a 1.2, 1.4, 1.6 and a 1.8, plus two diesels, a 1.7 and a 2 litre. And also to follow quite shortly will be two hot versions, one perhaps even carrying the Lotus badge, due respect to the work that Lotus engineers have put into the handling of the new Astra. Plus there'll be a cabriolet even further down the line. It wouldn't have taken much to make the Astra handle, ride and steer better, plus the ability to stop quickly rather than at its previous leisurely pace. Now the platform is totally new and will enable the Astra to come in a variety of body styles over the years to come. It has a hydroform aluminium subframe on which the front suspension is mounted, the coil springs, struts, dampers and anti-roll bar. Plus the body shell is 80% stiffer than before, which meant that the engineers could do away with a rear anti-roll bar. So, the exterior of the new Astra we like, but step inside the cabin and the interior and be positively underwhelmed. Well, it's not quite as bad as all that. Some of the early reports on this car were positively scathing about the interior, but we're not so sure. It's not very inspiring, but everything is good and solid. All the switch gear seems to work well and feels good. The seats are comfortable, there's plenty of space. There's some rather garish seat designs, which I wouldn't choose, but you might want them. And also, maybe it's just lacking in that certain je ne sais quoi. It needs a bit of spice. So much time was spent on the exterior that maybe the interior was forgotten about. Now this new Astra drives and handles like what it is, a new car of course. This 1.8 that I'm driving at the moment is a very free revving car. You put your foot down and it goes quite quickly, goes very nicely, handles well. And General Motors went right back to the drawing board with a fresh piece of paper for this car. That meant a new chassis, new floor pan, revised engines and a new suspension as well, which was tuned in the end by their colleagues at Lotus with particular preference made to the British style of roads and certainly the new Astra handles and drives like no Vauxhall before.
Now the market sector that the new Astra is in is surely one of the most competitive. There's the Peugeot 306, the Citroen Zara, and of course now VW's new Golf. There's the Escort and its replacement, the Focus. Now probably up until a few weeks ago, Vauxhall chiefs were very happy with the new Astra. That was until the Geneva Motor Show when all that changed and Ford unveiled their new Focus and quite literally pulled the rug out from underneath its rivals. Vauxhall and VW chiefs were probably stood there quaking in their pinstripe suits and Lederhausen as they looked at the radical new Focus and it almost makes the new Golf and this the new Astra look rather ordinary. So, have Vauxhall succeeded with the new Astra? Well, yes and no. On the negative side must be that cabin and the interior. And rumours are that a new cabin and interior are already being worked on and could be in the car in about a year or so's time. And like for like, say up against the Golf, the Astra's cabin is no match for it. And it's no cheap car either. They're very similarly priced. On the plus side though, you have to say the way it looks and the way it handles makes up for it. The engines are responsive, nimble and economical. Now, at some stage, if you haven't actually owned an Astra yourself, you'd certainly know somebody who has. And this unmistakably is a Vauxhall Astra, whereas the new Ford Focus definitely isn't an Escort. So what do you do? Do you wait over a year for the new Focus? Do you wait a few months for the Golf? Or do you buy an Astra now? Well, it's your money, it's your decision. Me, I think I'd maybe just hang on a little and see how things go. I'm sitting on the fence, I know, but make no mistake about it, this isn't a bad car. Now what we have here is the real fun part of driving the new Astra. Deep in the heart of Austria, Vauxhall have closed off an airfield for us and set up a special course to test out the dynamic capabilities of the Astra. There's a slalom course, there's a high speed brake test and there's of course the good old Elk test that caught out the Mercedes A-Class so badly. Hopefully it won't do the same with the new Astra, I'm sure it won't. Let's go and try, shall we? So first of all, there's this slalom test. You've got to stay in the cones, of course, not knocking any of the cones off. I'm taking it rather gently just at the moment, just to get used to it. Unlike the previous guy who took it very, very fast. Now we're into the slalom course. And this is in and out of these all the time, right the way through. And we're heading now towards the brake test. We've got to try and hit 100 kilometers an hour before stamping on the brakes at this particular point here. And it seems to do the job very nicely indeed. Down to the end, turning it round. Back up, there's a recommended speed of 60 kilometers an hour into this. This is the good old fashioned elk test. Took a few cones with me along the way there, I'm afraid. A lane change. And finally down to the last corner. Round we go, it's hard on the brakes in here. Taking it fairly gently back round to the end.
Well, we've sold over one and a half million Astras to date, and the car's never out of the top 10 best sellers list. Now, this car represents a one and a half billion pound investment, and we're very confident that it's going to become a number one bestseller. Well, we're going to discuss now the main aspects of the new Astra's dynamic capabilities. We've seen how it handles out there on the slalom course, the elk test, the brake test and all that. But how does it actually relate and what is the main differences over the old Astra? Paul, perhaps you can explain from a British point of view how people will, will see the differences in the new Astra. Sure. Um, basically, what we want the consumer to feel is not only more fun when they drive the car, but also when they're passengers in the car to have a more comfortable ride. And so obviously the focus of changes to the front suspension here and rear suspension are to achieve those two aims, basically fun to drive but equally safe and, and comfortable. And the body's been made 100% stiffer over the, over the last one but not at the expense of a poorer ride. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, the key about body stiffness is it gives a stable um, platform to kind of hang the suspension off. So, so what the consumer will feel is a more solid car on the road. And the other key is it's been done without weight expense because clearly weight means poor fuel economy and use of aluminium and magnesium means we, we've been able to shave those uh, weight, weighty components down. Now we've had a, a go at this slalom course outside, the elk test, the brake test. Do you think that's really relevant to the, to the average consumer who drives this to the supermarket or away on a trip on holiday? Well, I mean, obviously we've had a bit, a bit of fun out on the track and, and, and sure, not every consumer drives their car you know, to, to the limit or in a, a more enthusiastic way. Um, to, to the average consumer going shopping, it's much more important that the car is safe, secure and comfortable. And it's all of those things. What you need to do is appeal to those 5-10% of consumers who really like those, those country road sort of fun driving days and that's what this car can do as well. Well, we already have a very large order bank, so we think we can do 80,000 this year in its launch year. Next year, 100,000, maybe more, and we think we can take it to number one eventually.